right, thank you. So, I, uh, oh, did you want to introduce me? Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> um, now we have Joshua Greenstein, a PhD candidate at the New School for Social Research, and he'll be talking on new patterns of structural change and effects on inclusive development uh, for South Africa and Brazil. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, yes, my, my uh, presentation today is on, it's called New Patterns of Structural Change and Effects on Inclusive Development, a case study of South Africa and Brazil. This is a, uh, a sort of an initial step in a larger project. Um, I'm currently working on expanding this uh, uh, same type of analysis to a group of about 15 to 20 other countries and periods. So the hope is that this uh, sort of initial case study of South Africa and Brazil is sort of a jumping off point or initial, uh, initial look at the subject. So uh, the, the sort of motivation for this study is uh, this idea that I, I have here, all these different people who have been making this sort of argument recently, that uh, recent industrializers or countries that are currently growing and transitioning are following a, a different pattern than has, previ has previously been observed as far as uh, changes in the structure of the economy. Uh, most importantly, uh, the big point that's uh, most relevant to what I'm talking about is uh, the percentage of employment that goes to manufacturing, right? So the, the sort of traditional story that I'm sure we're all familiar with is this idea of a transition from agricultural-based economy and then a, a move towards manufacturing and then eventually a, a transition towards services. So what, what these uh, authors and others are, are arguing is that this isn't really what's happening in countries today, that uh, manufacturing employment is peaking at a much lower level of GDP per capita than it previously has, and that there's an early transition to services, but that this early transition to services is sort of a different type of transition to services than you see associated with uh, sort of already uh, wealthy countries, right? So my, my uh, project here is that I'm saying that this... Uh, the effect of these changing structural patterns on well-being has not yet been uh, systematically examined. So I'm saying, okay, let's say this new pattern is sort of the more common one now. What does this actually mean for how people live and, and how it's affecting people's lives? And again, this, the, this case study here is sort of a first step at trying to uh, look at this more closely. So what do I do? I'm using a multidimensional uh, measure of well-being. It's not income equality, so it's, I'll show you what it is more specifically in a little bit. But it's basically uh, something similar to some things that we're familiar with, like a multidimensional poverty index or something like that. I'm using it, at creating this measure on a household uh, level. And then I, I'm using this term, insertion of households into the economy, by which I mean uh, the location that they're living and the type of employment of the household head. So uh, again, I'll show this in more detail in a bit, but I'm, talk uh, I I'm breaking these uh, households into categories such as uh, you know, rural-based agricultural workers or urban low-level, uh, low-productivity services or urban manufacturing and things like that. Um, and then I, I'm looking at a periods of growth, so beginning and end year of about 10 to 15 years, and then looking at how the, how the changes in, in, these, in this part has affected this part, basically. Okay, so uh, I'll get to this later at the end, but what I, what I, the kind of argument I want to basically make is that, uh, particularly in South Africa, you see this big uh, spending on you know, social welfare mechanisms and that, and that in the lower performing groups, so for example, rural unemployed uh, households, you do see a big improvement, but that they're still being left behind very much this other group. And so what I'm, the argument that I hope to build towards is sort of that, uh, uh, something actually similar we heard about Brazil this morning as well, that perhaps this, uh, there's a limit to how much we can, you know, how quickly we can improve the population as a whole through, through redistribution, and that what's actually needed is a, is a better inclusion in the productive economy. Uh, so what I'm doing is making this multidimensional indicator, and then I'm using growth incidence curves and decomposition of change between groups to, uh, to make this argument, which I'll show later. Data is from census data from IPOMS. Uh, that's census of the entire population. It's a 10% sample. Once I you know, lose some observations by uh, missing data and things like that, I still have these very large 
samples. 98,000 is a small one. Brazil is over a million households. And uh, the, the reason why that's important, I think, for, for my question is I'm dividing these into like 15 groups. So I think it really allows me to, to do that and still be able to say something with statistical significance about these groups, which might be more difficult in a you know, 3,000 person or 5,000 person sur survey. Excuse me. So this is the indicator that I'm using. As I said, it's something you know, very similar to the kind of thing that we've often seen before, a multidimensional poverty index or something like that. Uh, the, the differences between that are, are, are basically based on data availability and the fact that I've used this to create a, a positive uh, indicator rather than negative. So this, these different types of things, again, calculated for each household, child survival rate, uh, school enrollment, electricity, clean water, access to clean water, et cetera are combined to make this uh, uh, household level indicator that's on a scale of 0 to 100. And then this is what I'm using to, uh, to measure well-being. So these are these types that I mentioned, right? So again, it's made by uh, two, two, basically uh, putting, make, creating these categories using two different um, criteria, whether it's a rural or urban location and the employment of the household head. So again, I mean, I was going through the whole list, but you know, so this is a, the household heads, a rural worker living in an agricultural area, or excuse me, other way around, agricultural worker living in a rural area. This is, uh, you know, high productivity services, living in an urban area, et cetera, right? Uh, rural unemployed, rural non labor market. Okay, so this is the first thing I'm doing. This is a, really a, probably a fancier explanation than's really necessary for what I'm doing with this part. So this is a growth incidence curve and basically what I've done is just uh, ordered the, uh, these types that I've just shown from the least uh, worst performing to best performing in the initial period. And then I've calculated a growth rate for each group and then it just draws a graph. And uh, the purpose of that is to sort of see if you know, lower performing groups are catching up, if they're growing at a faster rate than higher performing groups. The other thing I'm doing is this decomposition of change. So this is actually a, a method that I've adopted from a, a paper by Van Ark and Timmer, and they were using it f for uh, labor productivity. Um, and so I'm sort of adapting that to do with something about well-being. And so the idea here is that uh, it's related to my focus on structural change, right, and where people are living and what people are doing for a living. So this WBI is just well-being index, right? So this first equation is just showing, so this is the you know, average change for the well-being index for the entire period for this country, right? Excuse me, total change. Uh, and this is uh, the total change within groups, and this is the change from shifts between groups, right? So the idea is there's two different ways that the total uh, score can improve, right? Uh, households within a certain group can start doing better, or, house, or the proportion of households in a poorer performing group could get smaller and the proportion of households in a bigger performing group could get bigger, right? So what this method does is decomposes the entire change for the whole country sample and assigns each portion of that change either to improvements within a specific group, which is this one, right? So this is calculated for each group and it shows what portion of the total change is attributed to that group and then this is the uh, shift effect, which this one is calculated only for the groups where the proportion of the population have gotten bigger, right? And so what we're doing is comparing the average score in those, in those groups that have gotten, become a bigger um, uh, percentage of the population with the, scores that are, with the scores of the groups that are getting smaller. And so what this basically does is assign some portion of the total change, that's this part, uh, to shifts to larger groups, right? So if those groups that are getting larger are doing better than the groups that are getting shrinking, that are shrinking, this will be a positive number, right? And if, it's, if they're doing worse than the groups that are shrinking, this will be a negative number. And so when you add up all of these and add up all of these, you get the total change in the indicator. Uh, I don't think I need to do this slide in this room, especially I'm, I'm citing a lot of my panelists here fellow panelists here, I think, but uh, this is just a little bit, of, I just have a little bit of an overview of things, other things that are going on in Brazil and South Africa, which I don't think I really need to spend time on, but uh, the, the, the really basic important point of those slides that we just sort of skipped through is that they both fit this pattern of, you know, premature industrialization or, or low manufacturing employment or whatever you want to call it, 
And, uh, and so that's why I've used them here. All right, so these are the two periods that I'm looking at here. South Africa, 1996 to 2007. These are the two censuses I have in Brazil, 1991 to 2010. So just some descriptive statistics first to give an idea of how this indicator works. So again, this is, these numbers are this multidimensional index that I've created, and these are the average scores. It's on a, a scale of 0 to 100. So for example, you could see that uh, in South Africa, 96, the average was 65, and then by 2007, that had grown to 73. Right? You can also see, you see how we could use it to show differences between groups, right? where here you have, uh, this is the head, the head of the household is black, this average score was 60, head of the household white is 88. Right? By 2007, this gap has actually closed quite a bit. Right? The white head households didn't get a lot higher, they were already quite high, but there's this room for improvement, but uh, and the black headed households have caught up a little bit, right? So these are the kind of things that you can see with this thing. Say Brazil, it's a longer period, but actually the, the scores are somewhat similar and have grown by a little bit more, but again, a longer period, so 63 to 77. You can see the same kind of, uh, the same kind of disparity between groups. All right, so this is this uh, growth incidence curve that I, that I mentioned earlier. And so again, what I've done is these 15 groups or, or 20 groups that I showed earlier, the, the lowest performing initial one is here, the highest performing initial one is here, then these lines map the, uh, the growth rates, right? So one thing you see here, which is positive, is that uh, the lowest performing groups did in fact grow much more than the higher performing groups, right? Now this is somewhat built into the to the measurements, and this is a scale of 0 to 100, right? So this is what, if you didn't see this, it would be really a real big problem, right? But I, it's still, there, even for the, top, for the top performing groups, there's certainly a lot of room to improve. Their scores are high, but they're not at 100 already, right? So there, and these are all basic indicators that could go higher. So you definitely do see a real catch-up effect here, right? And it's a little bit flatter for Brazil, a little bit more even across. For South Africa, you see a, a, a bigger drop-off. Uh, this is just the, the, all of these groups. I, I, we won't go through every number, obviously, but uh, it gives you some of an idea of, of, the, of the differences that we're looking at, right? So this is South Africa. So again, scale of 0 to 100, you see like agricultural rural is 57 in 96. Um, Mid-level productivity services is almost 80. So there's these big, huge disparities in these groups. And uh, then it gets a little bit closer in the second period, but you can see the growth rates too uh, bigger for the lower groups. Something similar for Brazil. All right, so this is uh, this decomposition of change shown in graphical form that I that I showed the equations for earlier. So the way to understand this graph is that these are the these are the groups, right? And for every one of these bars represents the proportion of total change that are assigned to that group. So the black bars are the percent contribution of total change due to improvement within the groups. And the lighter gray bars are the percentage of improvement assigned to that group, to a shift towards that group, right? So if you added all of these bars up, you would get 100%, right? So what's interesting about this? The uh, biggest change from a shift effect is towards this urban low productivity services, right? So this is uh, sort of exactly the story we were talking about at the beginning with uh, it's like wholesale and retail trade, restaurants and, and hotels, things like that in urban areas, right? So that's a positive shift because uh, people, households in this category are doing better than households in the worst performing categories that aren't growing, like rural unemployed, uh, rural not in labor market, right? So there is this positive shift towards this sort of low level urban employment, we could call it, right? However, this group, when we looked at, oh, let me go, can I go back here? Yeah, so that's uh, this group, right? But the, so there's a big shift towards this group, uh, or a big effect, a positive shift of effects towards this group, but if you look at the actual like absolute scores, they're still doing worse than most of these other much better performing groups, right? And in fact, in many cases, they're doing worse than the higher performing groups were doing uh, even at the beginning of 1996. So the big 
effect of within group is in the initially poorest performing groups, right? So we see this big black bar here for rural, not in labor market, this big black bar for rural, unemployed, and they're doing much better. That's the high end of this growth incidence curve that I just showed, right? So what's the story here? That the improvement has come from within the lowest performing groups and this shift towards this sort of better but still not the best uh, sort of mid-level mid group. Uh, these are the, this is the same thing in numbers, but I think it's better to look at the graph. It's total uh, within group is 75% and, and shift is 25%, which will be relevant when we compare it to Brazil. All right, so here's Brazil. The graph is the same way here. Uh, there's almost no effect from shift, right? Almost all of the almost all of the uh, the uh, positive change is from within group improvement. In fact, some of these even have negative effects from shifts, which means these are lower performing groups that have gotten bigger as a percentage of the population. But here's this same group, which is sort of, I guess, the most interesting one for, for my question, which is this urban low productivity uh, services and, uh, and secondary. And there's this, they're also one of the initially poor performing groups. And there's this big effect of, uh, of within group improvement there, right? And also for agricultural rural, right? So here you see even less of an effect from shift than you do South Africa, and again you have these initially poor performing groups that are accounting for the uh, majority of the positive change. So here it's 97% compared to 75% for South Africa of contribution to total change due to improvement within, and only 3% due to shift. So I'm calling this initial observations, not conclusions, because uh, it's a uh, very initial project here. And uh, again, I, I, the goal is to be able to say something sort of uh, about global patterns as a whole by looking at individual countries. So this is obviously a first step. But what I hope to be working for here, towards here, is to make some argument like uh, this at the bottom. Yeah, that, so. The initially performing, poor performing groups are doing a lot better than they were originally, and that's the major source of change over this 10-year period, specifically for South Africa. But they're still doing significantly worse than all of the other groups, right? So the improvement of shifts in South Africa all came from this move towards low productivity urban services, which again is positive because that's better than the rural unemployed or the rural not in labor market, but it's still worse than all of the other types of urban employment that, 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 that exists, right? So I think the, uh, the positive way to look at these results, if we want to be sort of optimistic, would be to say, okay, in South Africa, there was this shift, to the, the biggest shift effect was towards low level urban work they're doing better than the rural unemployed or the rural non-labor market. And in Brazil, there was initially a lot of people in this type of work. And the biggest, the biggest uh, you know, positive effect there was from people within that group. So maybe now South Africans that are in this type of work and in this type of environment will start doing better too, and, and this story will work out. Right? That's, uh, that's the optimistic take. But I think the, uh, a more pessimistic or, 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 or worrisome uh, take could be actually something that we heard a little bit about again this morning in relation to Brazil too, that the reason why these lowest performing groups are doing better is because of sort of redistributive policies towards these lower performing groups. But even despite this big lift, they're still doing much worse than, than households that are more uh, productively inserted in the, into the economy, right? So the, the, the more pessimistic take would be that there's some sort of limit to improvement that can come from, from, from this uh, avenue, right? That, uh, that there's a, a limit to uh, just lifting up uh, the, the bottom performers through, uh, through redistributive methods and that what really needs to happen is that the people in these households need to become more involved uh, in the productive economy and that doesn't seem to be in many cases what's happening. So hopefully uh, the next time I see you we'll have uh, in another couple of countries there, and I'll be able to give you a, a better answer of which one of those uh, stories is the correct one. Thank you.